Hi, everybody, and welcome to our most recent episode of Let Me Introduce You, in which I introduce you to people that you should know. I see a whole lot of people jumping on today, which is great. So if somebody would be good enough to tell me that you can see the screen and hear my voice by letting me know in the questions box, then we can just jump right in. It's always a good thing. Oh, great, Patty. Thank you. Oh, hi, Patty. How are you? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle. This is perfect. All right. So we're going to just get into this because obviously you are here to hear about Marion Shambari and her fabulous book. And I am as well. So we're going to jump in and see if I can get the slides to move, which would be great. I'm Marion Roach Smith of the Memoir Project. I'm delighted you're here. Thank you for coming along. This is the latest in our series. And Marion Shambari is my guest today. She's an author and essayist. Her first byline, I love this, was at age 11 in Highlights for Kids. It was a poem about dragons, of course. And I have read many essays of hers on many topics in the New York Times, Cosmo, Marie Claire, Good Housekeeping. And I, at 34, she was diagnosed with autism. She lives in Portland, Oregon with her husband and daughter. And it's that diagnosis that led to this great book that we're going to talk about. So hi, Marion. It's another Marion. How hi, are Marian. you? Hi, <laughs> Marion. This is the best. I never meet other Marions in the wild. So this is such a joy. In the wild. I like it that we're both in the wild. I think that's really the important detail here. So, <laughs> so you were just telling me you're just back from two weeks of promoting your book. So take a deep breath and just <gasps> give us a little sense of what a book tour in 2024 is like these days. I mean, truly, I'm shocked they even sent me on one. Like, I'm not, like, an influencer. This is my first book. So it is very unusual that they sent me on one. I was really surprised. Um, and they basically just asked me, where do you have people? Where do you want to go? And so I gave them a list. And because it's a memoir, I really just listed out the places that are in the book, right? So I grew up in a little town in Connecticut. So I went to my hometown. I lived in New York for a long time, so I went to New York. I'd write about my college experience, so I went to my college home, college town. I live in Portland, so it's kicked off in Portland. So yeah, that's that's kind of how it worked. And so I ended up in six cities, and I got back a week ago, and then I took an entire week off work because I really needed to rest. Absolutely. It's very, very, very compelling to be out on the road talking about your work. And this is a wonderful book. I read it the minute it arrived here, and I really congratulate you for it. And I congratulate your publisher on seeing what a great book is. So mm -hmm. everybody here who's listening today is going to want to hear about how it is that you get a book to publication with a major publisher. Here's the book. Here's the cover. A Little Less Broken, How an Autism Diagnosis Finally Made Me Whole. The author is Marion Shimbari. And the story is quite something. She was 34. Uh, she had spent decades hiding her tics and shutting down in public, wondering why she couldn't ask, act like everybody else. And you heard an awful lot of diagnoses. You were told you had Tourette's, obsessive compulsive disorder, sensory processing disorder, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing helped. And it wasn't until you got to be in your 30s that you learned the truth. And this is an extraordinary story about a woman finding something in a diagnosis. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about what you realized when you got that diagnosis that then, then be, and then we're going to talk later about how you wrote about it in an essay and how you wrote about it in a book. But I'd like you to just to go back to that moment of aha, when this started to gel for you as a writer, as a human first, and then as a writer, that there was a story here. Yeah. <clears throat> The, the diagnosis itself, I, I had no intention of writing a book about it. It was purely just a personal thing that I had gone through that really changed my life for the better. I mean, I'm such a anti-self-help person. And so I hate talking about this part because it's so like woo woo. But really, it all it did was like make me understand myself. It allowed me to uh, deepen and kind of improve my relationships with the people who loved me but couldn't seem to quite connect with me because they didn't understand me. It changed my parenting. And so the moment I realized I was autistic was about two months before I actually was diagnosed. And in that moment, it was a friend that had been diagnosed and she was talking about her experience. And as she was talking, suddenly all these puzzle pieces, right? Like the corner pieces of the puzzle finally just kind of like latched together with the rest of my life. And it suddenly like everything just made so much more sense. And it just felt like this 
wave of relief to understand why I was the way I was, and that no amount of gratitude, journaling, therapy, antidepressants, we're going to change that, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the personal piece really felt like the most important. And it wasn't until almost six months later that I, once I'd been diagnosed, once I wrote this essay that you, that you mentioned, once I talked to other autistic people that I realized it wasn't just about me. It wasn't just this like, oh, look how my life changed when I found out I was autistic. It was hearing from so many other women who had been dismissed for decades, not just with autism, but with ADHD, OCD, endometriosis, postpartum psychosis, who had been dismissed for so long by doctors. And when they finally got a name for how they experienced the world, that's when their lives changed too. So that's when I realized it was a book. It's a lovely story of community. And that's one of the things that I like about it so much. When it drops into our heads that there could be a story here is, an, is a, a moment unto itself. Then as we figure out how to structure it, how to create an argument, how to write it, how to live through writing it, how to parent while writing it, how to write it while parenting, having a <laughs> yeah. relationship, paying the bills. Oh, you know, those myriad things that come along with writing a book. So let's get into that a little bit more because I was fascinated to look through and I've been reading um, your work for a long time and really appreciating it. And the people that are listening in are writing memoir. They're at some stage of doing so. And they want to know how to go from that daily writing practice because I know they all have writing practices because I work with the people who are on this call. But they want to know how to become a published author with a major publisher. And I think the stages of that are very important to understand. So let's just dial it back for a second and talk about the big questions. So people tell me all the time that they hear that agents are not interested in mental or physical health stories. So what do you say to that, Marion? Oh, I hate, I truly, I have no patience for the agents aren't interested in blank. Like, I just think that that's nonsense. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it makes me crazy. So do I. So so agents are not interested in mental, mental or physical health stories. Like, obviously, I can only speak for myself, but it would be false. I, I think I, I think I found a way. I think there are. It's not just me. I hate being like, well, I did it, so you can do it. I think that's also really obnoxious. But I think there are two things that made it helpful for me to talk about, for me to sell a book about essentially a mental health story. The first was the essay, right? I wrote an essay that a lot of people read and resonated with. So I had this proof and that's how I got the agent, right? A bunch of agents uh, emailed me after I had submitted the essay um, or after I published the essay. The second is in my proposal, I used a lot of data, um, specifically like internet data on how many people are searching for autism and late diagnosed autism in women. So I was able to tie it to a trend and mm -hmm. third, like if the story is compelling enough, agents will buy any or agents will sign anyone and publishers will sell anything. I just I think putting a blanket statement over any topic is just inaccurate. I totally agree. And it's just not true. So people can just relax. Agents are <laughs> interested in stories that can they can sell. And similarly, publishers are interested in memoir. So I hear this all the time. People say, oh, I hear publishers aren't buying memoir anymore. And I say, oh, I've got 120 books on my shelf of people that have published working with me. You just sold a memoir. Talk to me a little bit about the environment or talk to the people listening more particularly <laughs> about the environment of selling memoir that just from your point of view, that's the only yeah. expertise we're interested in today. Great. I will tell the story of how it happened. <clears throat> and if you want more specifics, I can go into that. But like I said, I was not... Um, planning on writing this book. I wrote in a very short 800 word essay and not even for a massive publication. I wrote it for a lifestyle blog of all places, but it turns out, <clears throat> sorry, I've got a frog in my throat. It turns out that a lot of agents read that lifestyle blog. It's called Cup of Joe for whatever it's worth. But um, so I wrote an essay about the autism diagnosis and within four days, I had three different literary agents asking for a call with me. And so I interviewed them and they all said varying degrees of the same thing, which is, this is a very trendy topic right now. You should write a book about it. The response on the essay was quite large and that said something to them. 
and they wanted me to write a hybrid memoir. So again, just my experience, lots of people write memoir that aren't hybrid, but if you don't know, a hybrid memoir is essentially a memoir that incorporates research or some sort of more universal element to the story. So for me, my memoir is about 90% personal story, no fancy storytelling um, techniques. It is chronological start to finish, and maybe 10% of it zooms out and gives a little bit of more context through research. So I have a chapter about my repetitive behaviors or stims, some people call them tics, and it's a type of thing that usually autistic people will do, and the common one is flapping your hands, right? You see a lot of autistic people flapping their hands. That's a repetitive behavior. So I have a whole chapter about my repetitive behaviors as a child, and then the last three to four paragraphs are research, talking about what are these repetitive behaviors? Is it more than just flapping the hands. Here's a story of another autistic woman who was missed because her repetitive behavior was something kind of hidden, right? So that's essentially what a hybrid memoir is, is it takes a little bit, doesn't have to be a lot, but a little bit of zooming out, and it makes the story um, more universal. That's the argument. So apparently, from what I've heard, that the hybrid memoirs are for a nobody like me without any sort of platform, right? I'm not on social media. Um, hybrid memoirs are quote unquote easier to sell than regular memoirs, but I don't think that's true either. I just think it's a trendy phrase right now. Yep. So my agent contacted me. She said, this is an the, you know, amazing story. You need to tell this, it needs to be hybrid. So then she had me write the proposal. And like I said, I, I hadn't intended to write this book. So I didn't have like chapters written. She wanted it in like three weeks. So I whipped up a proposal in three weeks. I wrote the first chapter of the book. And I came up with this whole outline, which I wrote completely based on your classes um, and your book. Thank you. And then a week Thank later, you. it was sold. I mean, and sold like for enough money that I don't have to work for like many years. Um, so that's, that's the short version of the story. Sure. And we're going to get into the, the essay in a minute. And so, you know, publishers, you answered the question. Publishers are interested in personal medical or mental health stories. These are these true falsies, that, these, these, these false statements that I hear every single day. And it's I hear that, and they've heard it from somebody who's an editor online. And I always yeah. say, that's not the editor for you then, because yeah, the per correct. your your obligation here is to make it so that somebody else will be interested. So I it's have... Not Two, yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but I have two other books that have also sold within the past year or two. One is called What My Bones Know by Stephanie Fu, which is a medical medical memoir with a little bit of research. And then the second uh, is The Cycle by Shaleen Gupta. Same thing. It's about PMDD. It's medical. It has a little bit of research. So it's not it's not just me. I know many people who have sold these kinds of books. Absolutely. And they have been selling forever. My first book, when I wrote at 27, I wrote a hybrid memoir Alzheimer's disease, it gives you just enough brain science, but it houses it in the story of my family's struggle with my yeah. mother's illness. So it's doable. So what I think it's important for people to understand that agents have, certain agents have specialties that they, things they like to handle. Some pub publishers have subdivisions where they, some of these subdivisions have topics that they like to specialize in, but publishers have seasons. And within those seasons promote only so many books on so many topics. So you may hear, oh, we already have a book on that this season. That is an interesting response. And then you need to go elsewhere. But I wonder if you have any other sort of general things to say to people about what else writers need to know that's outside of the nonsense that we hear from one, um, un, uh, un, uh, let's just say, unqualified person to another. You're a qualified person now. You've sold this book. <laughs> this book is out. So any other things along, you know, after this little small punch list of things that I always try to explain to people about publishers? Yeah, you know, I I got, I my advice here is is not, particularly good simply because agents reached out to me and then my agent pitched the publishers that she thought it would fit with. So mm -hmm. I didn't have to go through the querying process and I was lucky enough to have about six or seven meetings with different publishers. And at the end of the day, only one of them made an offer, but 
you know, all you need is one. It's not like it went to some bidding war or anything, but they made a good offer. And my agent was this very intense and did an amazing job kind of whipping up a perceived frenzy around the book. So this is all to say that I don't actually know the the more common kind of like, I pitched a bunch of agents and no one's getting back to me and public editors are saying no and blah, blah, blah. So I, I don't really have great advice there. Um, what I will say is I think not to like toot my own horn, but my proposal was really, really good. <laughs> and yep. I I used a lot of the like marketing techniques I learned at like the past, you know, decade plus of my copywriting career. And I really, I tried really hard to um, kind of think outside the box in terms, in terms of comp titles and um, look, like I said, about like having like really strong internet data and thinking outside the box in terms of like, here are the podcasts that I'm gonna pitch and here are the relationships I have, even though I don't have any sort of social media presence or newsletter or anything like that. So it was, it, I'm glad that I didn't actually know a lot of the rules because I might've frozen and not gone hard on some of the more like kind of weird techniques that I ended up using. Yeah, I think, I, but I think you did the thing efficiently. And that's the thing that I um, I want to stress here. You've written for Slate, Cosmopolitan, Good Housekeeping, The New York Times, Cup of Joe, as you said, your dad was in journalism. And I know a lot of listeners and participants are now saying, oh, well, I, 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 I don't do that. I don't have that. And I want to, and, and you've kind of answered the question and it's about this essay that you wrote. And so I want to talk about that. And, you know, you've written on a subject, serious subjects of traveling and manicures and making produce <laughs> last. But you wrote this piece for Cup of Joe, as you referred to earlier. And this is what I tell people every single day. Go write a piece that you think will attract and some attention around an idea that you think might make a book, that is the memoir that you think you'd like to write. And you, as, as here's a story that you told us before, a friend of yours got diagnosed. And so my question is, um, did you write the piece hoping to attract a larger audience or did you write the piece to test the argument on an audience? Did you write the piece with a, you know, like, well, you know, there could be a book here. That part, I don't think we've really answered. What was the intent of the original piece? I did it for fun. Like yeah. I, I had absolutely no intention of doing anything with it. Um, if I had had an intention of doing anything with it, I don't actually think it would have been accepted. And the, the, oh, well, I don't like have this like, uh, background that Marion has or whatever. Like, I, I absolutely get that. I think the only piece that I was able to land because of my dad was my New York Times essay, because it was about having a dad as a New York Times editor. So it was this very like inception <laughs> level essay. Um, mm -hmm. But for every other essay I've pitched, I've always done it cold. Um, but the Cup of Joe piece is such a classic example of I just wanted to do it because I thought it was interesting. So I am a regular reader of Cup of Joe. I read it every single day. I'm such a super fan of this blog. I participate in the comments a little bit, not excessively. Um, so it's not like the editor was familiar with me at all. I just know the kind of content she wants. So every Friday, she does like a link up, like here are 10 interesting things around the internet this week. And one of the pieces that she linked was an essay by Hannah Gadsby in The Guardian about Hannah's late in life autism diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, it's like my world's colliding. Like my personal identity is being reflected on this like very pink lifestyle website. And I was really excited. So I went down to the comments to say, Thank you so much for including this piece. I'm late diagnosed autistic, and it, it really means a lot to see myself reflected here. And a couple people responded to my comment saying, me too, I'm also late diagnosed autistic. And one woman said, I wish Joanna, Joanna's the editor, you should feature more stories from autistic people. And when she said that, I was like, well, like I'm a writer, I could probably do that. So I emailed Joanna very casually. I did not write an elaborate pitch, I didn't write the essay ahead of time. I don't even think I had a headline written. I just emailed her being like, I'm such a huge fan of the site. And I just told her exactly the story I just told you. Would you like me to write this essay? I'd love to write it. I'm happy to do it on spec since you've never had my writing before. And she responded in 15 minutes saying, yes, absolutely, I would love it. And so then I spent a week just writing it again, just for fun. Just, 
I think trying to process my own story maybe, but also I hadn't written a personal essay in a couple of years and it was truly done with no intention other than I love this blog. Clearly this story is resonating with readers of this blog. My style matches this blog, I will write it. But I'm terrible at pitching essays. I'm very bad at it and it I, I don't really like it that much. So this story was a bit of a fluke. That's a wonderful story. And it talks very much, the signature phrase I use at, at the memoir project for everything I do is write with intent, meaning that just absolutely get rid of the writing prompts and the writing exercises today. They are a total waste of your time. I've never used one. I've never given one to anybody. I don't believe in them. If you have 15 extra minutes, go read Cup of Joe. Read the place you want to get published in. If you want to write the modern love column, go read 25 of them. Study how they move. Go type in to a Google search box, modern love column submissions guidelines. The New York Times tells you what they want, how long they want it to be, and what seasons they accept the pieces. So what this really speaks to is that Marion had some expertise, even though she was not looking to sell a book based on this essay, the time she spends reading Cup of Joe paid off. So the idea of going short to long is a really good one. I tell people to do this all the time. They rarely take me up on it. And yet we have all this success. My three clients that have written the Modern Love column all got agents within days. It happens. Long history of, of clients writing op-eds and getting agents and editors. So you do get to test your argument on the public, which I think is very, very valuable. Um, what else did you think that you learned Oops, learned from tests from getting that short piece published? Um, did you learn anything about, you know, when you got such great response, did you say, well, that's nice, but I wouldn't expand it into a book quite like that. I would do this. You mentioned the part of, of somebody suggesting a hybrid memoir. What other responses did you have to the whole idea of going long from a short piece? I don't, I don't have a good answer to that because truly a bunch of agents suggested it. I've always wanted to write a book. So I thought, sure, I'll do this. <laughs> like it, I didn't actually put a lot of thought into it. And I didn't, I was just like, whatever. Like I had a full-time job. There was no pressure on this. It was like, if I can do it, then great. And so I did, I just wrote the proposal and then I sold it. So it, I don't really think I understood that I would be writing a book about it until somebody paid me to do it. And mm -hmm. I know that's like a terrible thing to say as an artist, but it was like, I. I have a full-time job and a kid. Like I, I don't have a lot of capacity to take on passion projects for free. Do you know what I mean? And so getting paid for it was the motivator to actually have me do it. Yep. I understand that totally. And so the whole idea of going short to long for me allows me to consider what I'm arguing, allows me to really think through, do I want to spend, if somebody's interested, the question becomes, do I want to spend the time it's going to take to write a proposal and then write the book? You know, a lot of people think, oh, well, the piece will write itself. I've actually never met anything that wrote itself. I'd be fascinated to see what that I looks wish. like. Yeah. That'd be amazing. So you have to figure actually, out. Actually, I think that's AI. I think that's what AI I guess is. That, I guess that is AI. I guess we can't say that anymore that I've never met anything that writes itself. But I've never met anything under my byline that wrote it wrote itself. So, you know, I I'm I guess I'm gonna stick to that. But the idea of what we can learn and what we want to commit to and do you want to spend the time on this book is something to consider because you're going to have to write the proposal. And I think that your story of writing it quickly is very deeply inspiring. Um, how long do you think, how long did it take to actually write the book? It took a year. So the, the essay itself took a week and I would really agree with you, even though it wasn't my intention, when it came time to write the proposal and then write the book, I actually had already written a summary of what the book was going to be about. Every sentence in my essay essentially turned into a chapter, right? A little paragraph about my ex-boyfriend in London turned into two whole chapters. My whole message at the end of the essay that having an autism diagnosis allowed me to love myself in a way that I can't remember the exact phrase that I used, but it allowed me to love myself in this new way. That's the thesis for the book. And I could not, if someone had just said, write a book about your autism diagnosis, 
I would have had no idea where to start. So even though I didn't have this like almost like conscious understanding of my intention, the essay is exactly what you're saying. It tested the argument. It allowed me to see people's responses and the, the you know, there's like 200 comments on this essay. Those responses really allowed me to see which parts of the argument resonated with people and how yes. big this story was beyond myself. And also the people that were angry, there were lots of angry comments too. They turned into a whole chapter in the book. So it was so, so enormously helpful. So just touching on that short to long thing, writing the book took a year. I wrote half of it uh, in an hour every morning before I started my day job. And I'd like mapped it out. If I do a chapter a week, like rough draft a chapter a week, I'll be done in X amount of months. And then I'll go back and I'll edit it and blah, 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 blah. That did not work. I could not have done this with a full-time job. So I quit my job about five months in. And then I wrote full-time all day, every day for another seven months. That's so helpful. And I really love the idea of a sentence of the piece turned into a paragraph or a chapter, or in the case of the ex-boyfriend in London, two chapters, that mm. you understand that you do write a short piece that condenses everything, but it does give you not only the courage, but the outline for yes. the larger piece. I've had that experience. Absolutely. And I think that a writer, to live a writing life, needs to know how to write a blog post, how to write an essay, how to write an opinion piece, how to write a long form essay, and how to write a book. Otherwise, they get stuck writing this one big book that begins with their great great grandfather and ends with what they had for lunch today, which they're <laughs> never going to finish and no one's ever going to read. But if you want to be a writer, if you want to have a writing life, the skill set, the toolbox is so important because you can try a shorter piece. Two of my four books came from shorter pieces that I wrote and I got, like you did, responses. And the second thing that, that you said that's so, that's so poignant to me is even the haters, even the criticism, even the people who were distressed for whatever reasons by the piece contributed to your ability to write the book. And that's yeah. true too. I did not know that there were all these people out there who were having an, a poor Alzheimer's families when I first wrote about Alzheimer's disease. And when the letters started coming in from after a magazine piece I wrote, I understood that there was an audience for my book. It was yeah. a little overwhelming, but even the ones that were heartbroken um, over what they were living with provided me with some real context for the need for the book. Some real, yeah. it really compelled me into writing it. So, so what, what other tips can we pass along? Um, you know, you, I think you've covered most of this. How about how we construct it and how we bring it to an editor? You got some great response from this cup of Joe piece. Now cup of Joe is going to benefit from a whole lot of readers tomorrow. I know this Friday, I know <laughs> <laughs> from everybody wanting to go and, and it is a wonderful, wonderful online piece. I just love it. I read it too. I think it's great. And um, are there anything, uh, what do you think about going forward? If somebody asked you for advice on their own story, um, do you have a, any, you said, you know, the best thing I think you've said so far is you did this for fun. I love that so much. So, you know, when people dig in and say, oh, if I write this piece, I'm going to get a book so, and then I'm going to be on the Today Show. And it's like, oh boy, wait, hold on. Let's write this for fun. So get, why don't you just give us a little bit more yeah. on <laughs> Let me, I'm going to tell you a story. Great. My mother is, my, my mother is also a journalist and she freelances for the times and is, she's written a couple books and she's very intense. She gives me a lot of very intense feedback. And she called me a couple months ago and she's like, Marion, I know you're going on book tour and you're very stressed about the book, but there's a story that you must write an op-ed about for the New York times. And I was like, huh? I don't read the New York times. I don't know what story you're talking about. And she's like, It'll, an op-ed in the New York Times will do more to sell your book than your book tour. And it was Tim Walls' son, Gus. I don't know if anyone yep. saw this happen, but he yep. got very emotional at the DNC or something like that. Yep. And everyone was calling him weird. And she's like, you should write a piece about this. And I was like, I don't know anything about Gus Walls. I don't read the news. I'm not following the election. I like, I'm, I'm whatever the opposite of chronically online is. Political op-eds are my worst nightmare. Nothing about that sounds fun. But when your journalist, like author mother says, this will do more to sell your books than your entire book tour, 
you like begrudgingly do it. So I like canceled all my weekend plans <laughs> and I watched all the videos of Gus Walls, who's neurodivergent, crying about his dad. And I pulled, I pulled an opinion out of my ass and it wasn't a real opinion. It wasn't fun to write. It mm. wasn't helpful in any way. It wasn't joyful. It was painful. And by the end of the day, I'm crying. I'm like, I hate this. This is not the writing that I want to do. I want to write personal stuff. I want to write fiction. I want to write stories, right? I can't even answer your question without going into a story. This is how like my brain works. Yep. I don't want to have an opinion about a kid I don't know anything about. Yep. Which is all to say, of course, nobody wanted this essay. You know what I mean? I pitched it yep. to like, 20 different publications by the time the last publication said no it was such old news nobody cared so yeah i guess i'm saying is i did it for fun right like that that doing something for fun like you could just tell in the writing i look back on it and i'm honestly embarrassed that i pitched that to the new york times really it's well, bad it is a go. bad op-ed <laughs> best story you could possibly tell us and i totally agree with you about that i always say to people try to love the work because yeah. there is no way to predict what's going to happen. It could be, you could just be swallowed up in a news cycle. You could have the best story ever on the most timely topic there is. And then something cataclysmic happens in the world and you're, the news cycle wipes you out. So you can't predict the response. But if you hate writing it, I can pretty much predict what the response is going to be to that piece. It's not going to yeah. go anywhere. So good for you. That's a that's a great story. I love that. So we've got um Mary, I'm going to open it up to questions cuz we're going to be here for another oh like 20 minutes probably. We've got a we've got a hard stop at 10 of, but Marion Chimbari's book A Little Less Broken How an Autism Diagnosis Made Me Whole is out from Flatiron Books, which is a division of Macmillan. And Marion is at marionchimbari.com where she also very graciously lists the pieces that she's written and they're wonderful and I really 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 encourage you to buy the book and to go read her pieces but let's see what kind of questions you have the questions are in the quite in the questions box on your go to webinar control panel so go put them there um, and we've got some of them answered. Where did she publish the essay Kathy wanted to know in Cup of Joe, J-O? And it's not J-O-E, it's Joe, right? J just J-O, yeah, I think? Just yeah, J-O, yep. Yeah, and so, um, yeah. So <laughs> uh, Patty uh, agrees that she's so tired of hearing about the things that publishers won't publish. She knows she published a beautiful book um, that has a medical story uh, attached to it. And let's see, um, somebody wants to know if the slides and recording will be shared. Yes, you'll receive a, re uh, a recording of this tomorrow when you, um, yeah, 24 hours after we get off the call. So Elizabeth wants to know how, why did you choose the one agent you signed with over the others you didn't? What was your criteria? Yeah. Great question. So yep. I interviewed, I interviewed all three. <clears throat> one was uh, a little newer than I would have liked, and I'm sure she would have been amazing, but because I had options, I kind of discounted her pretty quickly. Um, the second one was, uh, she was at a big agency. She was lovely. She published a couple books that I had heard of, um, but, and was very friendly, and I really liked her, and she was very much just like, whatever you want to write. Like, I think the autism thing would be great, but like, you know, whatever. But Molly, uh, the agent that I did pick, truly I picked her because she was so intense. She was pushy with me, which I appreciated because I want someone to be pushy to sell my book. And she was, she ended up being very rabid with the editors that she pitched to. And she really did like whip up this frenzy that didn't even exist. She was like, oh, I need everyone's offers in by Wednesday at 5 p.m. I was like, who's offers? Nobody's making offers. But like she convinced <laughs> the editors that like there was this big like bidding war and there just wasn't. So anyway, this is all to say I picked her because our conversation, she said something to me um, that I still remember, which is I treat all my authors like entrepreneurs. I don't oh. just care about this one book. I care about your whole career and that she tends to get most of her authors by reaching out to them, not all of them, but um, 
I think she just likes people's voices. And I, I felt very moved by that, that she cared about me and my long-term career as a writer. And she was pushy with me and I knew that's how she would be with editors. And she was at CAA, which is- uh, the, the biggest agency her, in the world. Yeah, and how could I, I wasn't gonna say no to CAA, basically. Yeah, and that is a great series of decisions that you made. And pushy is good. Very, very, very wonderful to be with a big agency. I know I'm also with CAA. They have multiple divisions. They they merged with ICM a couple of years ago. Makes a huge difference. You can walk something over from one division to the other, and it works. Yeah. Good for you. Uh, Sue asked a bunch of questions that we answered, I think, that slides will be shared. We, we know what a hybrid memoir is and the time it took to write the memoir. So thank you for the question, Sue, but I think we answered all those. Um, Patty asks, what in particular do you think made your proposal so good? Mm. Let me pull it up. I'm going to look at it while I answer this question. Um, so I, while I pull this up, while um, before I uh, sold this book, I worked in marketing and I collaborated on another book, even though my name's not on it. So I had the experience selling another book and she really, she just pimped herself out so much. Um, and so I stole some of that kind of energy. I made myself seem like a bigger deal than I am because I do have a lot not going for me, right? I'm not <laughs> an influencer in any way. I have written, I have some bylines, but not a ton. It's not like I'm writing essays every day. I'm not like on staff at the New Yorker. I don't have social media. I barely had a functional website. And so I really had to had to lean on the other things that would make me seem impressive. So the first thing I did is I went on to Google. I went on to Google Trends and I did a search for the phrase late diagnosed autism and autism in women. And I took a screenshot of the search results. And I wish I could share my screen so I could show it to you. But basically, here's what I wrote. I'm going to read you the first paragraph. Um, so this is under the audience section. And right. I wrote. It's estimated that over 75 million people have autism spectrum disorder. The number of people diagnosed has jumped over 700% in the past 20 years. The exponential increase included more women than men with it the greatest rise among adults. You can see the story reflected on Google. Searches for the phrase, am I autistic and undiagnosed autism have skyrocketed with nearly 34,000 searches per month. And then I include a screenshot of essentially a straight line of where you can see that the phrase undiagnosed autism has has just jumped straight up since 2020 which is to say i tried to make like a logical and this is part of my like autism brain i tried to make a logical case for why this would be a smart business decision for them and i looked at okay here's a handful of books about late diagnosed autism in women there's a couple of memoir a couple of memoirs by women and there's a fair number of kind of like nonfiction books about autism, but there was nothing that combined the two. So I could make a case that this would be one of the first commercially like published hybrid memoirs by an autistic woman. I also went onto YouTube and I took screenshots of the YouTube videos where it says, am I autistic? 25 questions to ask yourself with 1.2 million views. Yep. Basically showing, I listed all the celebrities that had been diagnosed with autism late in life. So that includes Anthony Hopkins, Greta Thunberg, Hannah Gadsby, Josh Thomas. I listed all the celebrities. And then I went into the Cup of Joe piece and I pulled comments, almost like testimonials, just like you do for like a marketing video or a Facebook ad, right? You'd have testimonials being like, this is the best pair of pants I've ever worn, except I did that for my essay. So I pulled in five, six, seven different comments from people saying like, again, I feel kind of silly saying this now, but it's like, this is the best thing I've ever read. And <laughs> this was 100% identical to my own experience or I'm 50 and I was just diagnosed with autism. And so I pulled all those comments in to give a human face to why this story is so important. So basically I made a sales pitch for my book. Yeah, you did. That's a great answer. Thank you. And I'm sure Patty will be delighted by that answer. It's so inclusive. That's wonderful. Um, Renee asks if we can include a link for Marion's essay. Just go to marionshimbari.com. She lists the, the essays right there available on the site. Um, Janet wants to know, and we're going to have to 
go through, we have about 10 minutes left, so we'll try to go quickly through these. At what point did you work with an editor? I'm assuming you worked with an editor once you got to the publishing house, but is there a different answer to that for Janet? Marion? Well, my editor, I actually also hired a freelance editor for no other reason that I was self-conscious. Um, so I uh, worked with my editor at the publishing house who was very, very, very hands-on. Um, and she gave me feedback, I think every three to four months, she'd give feedback on all my new pages and we'd go back and edit them together. So I was really lucky with her, but I also wanted an editor to do line edits. I didn't just want like developmental big picture stuff. I wanted someone to go through and like critique my prose. And I did that pretty early on. I hired someone to just read 30 pages every month to kind of keep me accountable. And then I hired another editor who did line edits and I sent her a chapter a week. And so she also basically, that's my long way of saying, I hired editors pretty early on a, because I wanted it done quickly because I had a deadline and B, because I didn't trust that I was a good enough writer and I just wanted outside feedback to help me make my copy as tight as I could get it. Fabulous. We have a, a Noah wants to know if you have a, uh, if you had an argument in an algorithm using my formulation. So I remember I that you did. Yeah. So do you remember what it is? Yeah, I think that, oh God. Give me one second. I might even still have it. Memoir. I know. Okay, no, I don't have it on my computer, but I have done it and I probably, oh no, wait, I have my email. Hold on. I'm going to tell you because this is so. Yeah, you sent it to me I and I should have put it up there as a yep, slide. Homework. Um, yeah. Here it is. Found it. Found it. Fabulous. Algorithm. It's about the power of identity and self compassion, as illustrated by my late in life autism diagnosis, as told in a book. The argument, the normal world is too loud, itchy, and confusing for thousands of women. We go through life feeling deficient and broken when we can't cope. But when we're finally given a name for how we feel and experience the world, a diagnosis, it's a powerful moment of healing and liberation. Ah, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. That's terrific. Thank you for your help. Oh, well, I'm delighted. I'm so we're just I'm just so excited about your book. It's so good. So um, Sarah asks, do you normally write a proposal for memoir? She was under the impression that you write the whole book first, much like fiction. I've always been told you write a proposal, but everybody's different. What? And you don't have to answer for everybody. In your case, you wrote a proposal. I wrote a proposal first, but I have a friend who doesn't have an agent and she's having a hard time getting agents without the whole thing written. And I think part of it is that she doesn't know what her argument is. She's still figuring it out. And I think they can tell, I think the agents can tell that she doesn't quite know how it's going to end. So I think if you have an amazing proposal with like a very clear sales pitch and a very clear, clear argument, I think you can sell it with a proposal just fine. Um, yeah. But if you don't know what the book is about yet, and uh, you know, I think sometimes you have to write your way through it. So it depends is the answer, unfortunately. They, they definitely want to know that you know what the book is about. So however you yeah. can prove that is a really important. I think it is drilled into the most important thing there. Kate um, is quoting you and said, I told her I can write it on spec since she didn't know my writing and wants to know what on spec means exactly. For free. I said yeah. I'd write it for free and send her what I'd written, and then she can decide whether or not she wants to publish it. Great. Rosemary wants to know, says, I've heard all agents want to know what your next book is. What was your experience? And if so, what is your next book? Um, and uh, says that just bought your book both on Kindle and Audible. Can't oh, wait baby, <laughs> you're the best. Thank you so much. That's really, really <laughs> kind. Um, yeah, I uh, I have always wanted to write books. I have like a million half finished novels on my computer um, and my agent absolutely cares what my next book is. It's very, very different from this one. It is a novel about abortion and she knows that I'm working on it and she gave me like a three month deadline to finish it. I told you she's insane and very I intense, love her. I love she her. Me she keeps me going, you know, yeah. it's like, I would never finish a novel in three months, but now I'm like, I got to do it because Molly says so. Um, so yeah, right. I personally, I'm, that's why I picked her, right? Because she cared about my long-term career and she, it's, it's for her benefit if I write more books and sell them. She makes more Absolutely. money. Yeah, that, exactly right. 
Uh, Melissa asks uh, and says the book is on order. So wonderful. And yes. asks the question I think we can answer easily. Can the reverse work? Writing a book length memoir first and an essay later. Yes, that's one of the best ways to keep the book in circulation is to write lots of pieces during the publication process that promote the book. So you re that's why you really need to have everything in your toolbox. And Sarah asks, is it possible to publish a memoir using a pseudonym? Um, it's, yes, it is, Sarah, and you'd need to have a pretty good reason for it, but I think that it's something that you wanna discuss with your publisher, having to do with, um, you know, if you're worrying about something being actionable, your publisher is going to um, consider that. So I don't know if you have anything to say on that, Marion. I, I certainly know people that have published under a pseudonym. But yeah, anything is possible. Someone who tells you that's impossible, it doesn't know what they're talking about. Anything yeah. is possible. I know. I hate these rules because they, they're all, they've all been broken. Um, yeah. Yes, BC, you will receive a, re, a, a recording of this. Uh, Disna says, I wrote a book proposal 25 years ago. Has the format changed? And is there a reference book outlining the process? I send everybody to janefriedman.com. That's Jane Friedman, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N, for anything having to do with the business of writing. Uh, Marion, what do you say about um, a template or instruction on writing a book proposal? I My agent gave me three or four from her clients of similar yep. books like mine, which are I've seen other proposals for pure nonfiction books or even for novels. Right. And they're all really different. So I think your best bet, if you can find people who are who have written a book that's similar to yours, who don't mind sharing. I don't usually share on, on groups like this, but I absolutely share with my friends, you know, so I, I think just ask. I'm, I'm always happy when people ask me. Um, I like to look at examples because they're all a little bit different. And yeah. even so, people obsess over the order of things. Oh no, am I supposed to put my bio before the chapter summary? None of that matters. I followed these templates perfectly and my agent moved everything around. So like <laughs> even the templates, he was like, this is great, but because you're a nobody, we don't want your bio till the end. We want mm. the audience, right? So they all just changed the rules. Yes, because you're a nobody is my new favorite phrase. I think I'm going to get a t-shirt that just says that. Just wear it a lot. I yeah. only say it because we obsess about platform. And like, I don't know what to tell you, but I sold a book for a ton of money with no platform. And so like, it, it, it makes me irritated when people have these rules. Because I'm like, well, I, they, I didn't have to follow those rules and it worked great for me. So yeah. And I think that's the other t-shirt. I sold a, a book with... <laughs> with over a ton of money with no social media platform. <laughs> because again, right, exactly. I know lots of writers who have, and I know lots of writers who just refuse or say they haven't got the time. So um, Kate wants you to know that um, she listened to the Audible version, that it's amazing and wonderful oh. to hear it read in your voice and that it's beautifully written. So there you go. Thank That's you, Kate. Wonderful. That's really kind. Thank you. It's lovely. All right, we're going to wrap it up with this question from Kathy, who is 56 and recently realized that she has autism and pre-ordered the book after Marion Rick mentioned it. I mentioned it in a previous webinar, as a matter of fact, and read it in a oh read it in a few days a couple of weeks ago and loved it. So there you go. Everybody, go buy the book. Go listen to the Audible. I put up in the newsletter, like last week, I put a link to her reading that first chapter that's on YouTube. There's lots of ways to interact with this book, but one way or the other, go get it. Marion Shimbari, you are a, just a perfect writer, and I thank you so much for coming thank on today you. and sharing this with everybody. Everybody, send out a shout out to Marion Shimbari saying thank you. Go buy the book. Go listen to the book. And Marion, we are waiting by the bookshop door for the next one, so thank you. <laughs> next one. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. All right. Be well, everybody. Take care and stay in touch. Bye-bye.